Judge Psychology. I really like this lecture. This is probably the lecture that I do that I like more than any of the other lectures. Uh, and I think that it is super useful. It's a little bit abstract in places. But um, I think if you kind of get the concept, it can make a huge difference in your debating. The lectures, a lot of times, that you will uh, hear on a, su a subject similar to this, you'll hear a lecture called Judge Adaptation. Or when you hear people talking about uh, the, the issues that I'm going to talk about, a lot of times they're framed as Judge Adaptation. And uh, I heard um, one of my kind of debate <coughs> heroes slash mentors, Ross Smith, who was the long time coach at Wake Forest University, uh, and who has passed away in the last few years, um, give a lecture about judge psychology that totally changed the way that I think about debate. And it has changed the way that I've taught debate. And the thing that Ross said um, in differentiating judge adaptation from judge psychology is that judge adaptation requires adapting to the fact of judging. Adaptation to the fact that judges in general are different than debaters. And adaptation to the fact that your debates are being judged. Judge adaptation is 90% adapting to the fact of judging, and 10% adapting to different judges. If you're good at adapting to the fact of judging, the differences in judging will make relatively little difference. And uh, when he said that, I was like, wow, that's, that's not, you know, it, we come to think like, oh, this judge is so much different than this other judge. This judge, you know, has this preference, and this judge has that preference, and it's just so much different debating from different judges, but 90% of what you need to do to better communicate with your judges is totally divorced from who that individual person is and all about the fact that that person is judging and what it means to judge and what it means to debate in front of a judge, to debate around that is judge. So this lecture is about that 90% of judge adaptation, uh, which Ross calls adapting to the fact of judging. And the format is as follows. The first subpoint, or first Roman numeral, the first big section of the lecture is the differences between debaters and judges. The differences between debaters and judges. The second uh, main part is the facts of judging. So what it means that there is judging. And I think that that's more profound than most people understand. And the final uh, main point is how to better persuade judges to vote for you. How to better persuade judges to vote for you, knowing the differences between debaters and judges, and knowing the facts of judging. So Roman number one, the differences between you all, debaters and judges. Debaters and judges are very different. Their roles in debate are different, but debaters often fail to understand what those differences are and the ramifications, both philosophical and practical, of those differences. Good debaters are good at debating. Great debaters are good at debating, and they're good at speaking the language of judge. Speaking the language of judge. Really good debaters <coughs> learn to speak judge, and that's almost like learning a foreign language, because it's dramatically different than debating. When debaters look at other debaters, they think, oh, that person is really good at the thing that I'm good at. They're really good at debating. Here's someone who can debate really well. When judges look at students, they obviously appreciate good debating. But there's an element to the judging process that demands more than just good debating, uh, or rather probably changes the definition of good debating. In uh, the labs that I've taught the last few years, we've made a really big deal about simulating the judging experience. So we try to force students to write full ballots, to listen to debates, to render decisions, and to really think about the process that it takes to judge a debate, uh, how hard it is to come up with a decision and to justify that decision. And I think almost uniformly, almost everyone, universally, uh, has found that experience extremely enlightening. And so I encourage you, as much as possible, to assume that role when you're watching a practice debate, when you're watching an in-lab uh, debate, or when you're watching a mini-debate in-lab, you're judging at novice tournaments, you're judging practice debates. Uh, because when you're positioned as a judge, I think you open your eyes to the differences between what it's like when you're a debater, when you're a participant in the round as a debater, and when you're a judge and you're participating in that different role. So knowing these differences between 
debating and judging, very important. Here are the top 10, and this was first explained to me by Ross. Number one, debaters are emotionally invested in their debates. Judges are not. Debaters are emotionally invested in their debates. Judges are not. When you're in a debate tournament and you're about to go into a round, and then throughout the course of that round, you're pumped up. You have a lot of adrenaline. Sometimes you're excited, you're anxious, you're nervous. Sometimes you're just really like jacked up. You're just, wow, debate is awesome. I can't wait for this debate. And that makes sense because you really want to win that round. It means a lot to you. You've put in a lot of work. Now, this is, a lot of you, this is why you debate. You really want to win. Judges are much less invested in any particular debate. A lot of times they're tired. They're distracted. They're bored, honestly. But in any case, they just don't have the same adrenaline rush that students get, that debaters get. And the debate's not necessarily exciting for them. There are a variety of reasons why that's the case, but it's just not their debate. Makes sense. Number two, debaters understand most of what is said in a debate. Judges do not. Debaters understand most of what is said in a debate. Judges do not. <clears throat> Think about it. When you're giving a speech, you probably understand 100% of what you're saying. Or you at least understand 100% of what you're trying to say. When you're listening to your partner's speech, you probably get you know, 90% of what they're saying. Because you know what their materials are. You know, you've heard them debate a million times. You're familiar with their voice. You're familiar with their arguments. You talk to them. You see their speech document. And that doesn't, it doesn't really matter how incomprehensible you and your partner are. You still you get like 100% of yours, 90% of theirs, you know, 95% of the total things communicated, the total utterances by your side. You, you get those. You understand, you know, most of what your opponents say, maybe most, you know, a good chunk of what your opponents say. Because you have a speech document to follow along, you know, you can ask them questions. You probably know a lot about the arguments, so, you know, if you're affirmative, you know the negative to your, your case. If you're negative, you kind of know what that app is. So even if they're not, you know, super comprehensible or super clear or organized, you've got a you know, pretty good sense of what they've said. Judges only understand what is clearly communicated to them. So if your speeches are not comprehensible, judges don't understand the content. Even judges that request speech documents and kind of try to follow along aren't following along as closely as debaters. Very few judges even do that, or request a speech document at all. And judges aren't used to hearing you speak, and your partner speak, and the other team speak. So they're not super familiar with your arguments, and they're not super familiar with your delivery. So they just get a lot less of the content. It's just a fact. Number three, debaters want their judges to be open-minded, blank slates. Judges want to be active participants. Debaters want their judges to be open-minded, blank slates. Have. Judges want to be active participants. This also makes a lot of sense to me. Debaters really want their judges to be calculating. They really want their judges to be kind of flowing machines. They want them to be robots where uh, you don't really have to deal with any human being. You don't have to deal with an emotional person or a person with biases or a person with flaws and shortcomings, a person who can't pay perfect atten uh, attention at all times. You would love like C-3PO to judge your debate because you feel like that would give you more control. You want all of the control. <coughs> Judges don't want to give up all of that control and they don't want to be mindless. Even judges that make it their whole philosophy to intervene minimally or to be really strict flow judges, they still want to be participants in the round. They want to be active educators. They want to be intellectually engaged in the debate. They want some role that's not just a tool of the students that are debating in front of them. <coughs> they don't want to just be C-3PO. 
That makes sense. Number four, debaters are preoccupied with the win or loss. Judges don't really care. Debaters are preoccupied with the win or loss. Judges don't really care. When you are in that big debate, you know, it decides whether you clear, it decides whether you make the elimination rounds, it decides whether you make the finals, it decides whether you win the tournament, it decides whether you be an important rival, whatever. You care about winning that debate more than anything. As I said before, you're really invested in the debate. It means a lot to you. You spend a lot of time, the round matters, you just care a lot about who wins. But judges always, always have to vote against one team or the other. So they're much less preoccupied with the W and the L. They're much more interested in making a good decision that facilitates some education occurring. They don't want debate to be just a win-loss game because they're always 500. They always vote for one team and vote against the other. The judge can't win. So the judge wants the game to meet <coughs> regardless of who won. And they hope to get it right. But that's not, the who wins and who loses is not their primary focus. Number five, debaters are excited by the novelty of their arguments. Judges have seen it all before. Debaters are excited by the novelty of their arguments. Judges have seen it all before. So every year, some debater somewhere finds some argument and they get really excited about it. They think that it's awesome and cool and they go to a tournament with this argument and they're just so excited to show it off and they can't wait. Uh, you know, they're, it's usually stupid, something like, you know, Malthus or Lanza or whatever. Weird Ks, dumb T arguments, dumb counterplans. But they're hoping that, you know, they're gonna read this and it's like, they're gonna be cool. Everyone's gonna be talking about them. You know, they're gonna go in the hallway after the debate. Their friends are gonna be like, what'd you go for? And they're gonna be like, Lanza. And everyone's gonna be like, wow, that's so cool. Judges aren't gonna be that impressed. They're gonna be bored with the repetition. They've seen almost every argument before. And they've usually seen someone else who's better than you express that argument or introduce that argument or debate that argument, whatever. They certainly appreciate good arguments, they appreciate new arguments, but they're much less excited about it than the students are. And in particular, they're really unexcited about the garbage arguments that debaters tend to think are awesome, just because they're different. Number six, debaters believe that debate is just a game. Judges seek coherence and educational value. Debaters believe that debate is just a game. Judges seek coherence and educational value. Every summer when I teach Summer Institute and every season when I'm coaching uh, students as they start to you know, progress from novice to kind of JV level, and this continues for a lot of people throughout their whole career. What they desperately want me to tell them is exactly what to do in a certain circumstance. So they'll say like, should I have, I mean, I was just over in the other room talking to, to Seth and, and one of the uh, students from my lab. And you know, the questions are like, should I have long cards or short cards in the one I see? Should I have long cards or short cards in the one I see? What balance should I have between impact arguments and solvency arguments on the case? How do I decide which arguments to extend in the block? How do I extend, decide which arguments in the two and are? All of these questions are just attempts to create a checkbox or checkmate version of debate. You just want to be able to check off the boxes and then automatically win the debate. You want to be able to say something like, our opponents have dropped X, Y, and Z, so we win automatically checkmate. Debaters want it to be just about that execution and about those checkboxes. And they really desperately want to win automatically if they do certain things and the other team does not. Judges are much less interested in that and much more interested in voting for something coherent, either a policy or an intellectual position or something. They want to be able to say after the debate that they voted for something that they can describe as a good position to take. 
They want to try to teach the students something. They want to say, I thought the affirmative was better than the negative because I thought that they presented the better policy, or I thought the negative was better than the affirmative. I thought the intellectual position they gave me was much better than voting for the plan. And obviously, 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 technique and execution and all that matters. But debaters are too, uh, too invested in that model, the checkmate, checkbox model. And judges are much less invested. That doesn't mean drop stuff. Judges think about that differently. Number seven, debaters think their arguments are more important than the arguments of their opponents. Judges take both sets of arguments equally seriously. Debaters think their arguments are more important than the arguments of their opponents. Judges take both sets of arguments equally seriously. Debaters all the time, whether they're affirmative or negative, and whether they're debating about a policy or topicality or theory or a critique or whatever, always, always, always want to make their arguments a priority. Or they want to say that their arguments are a gateway or they come first or their prior question or all of that. It makes sense because it makes it easier, but it also makes sense because students know their arguments well. A lot of times they think that their arguments are correct. So they try to spend the whole debate just kind of like reminding the judge, like, hey judge, remember when I introduced this argument that was totally awesome? Yeah, that's what you should be considering first. Just like evaluate that, we know it's great, you know it's great, just vote F, we're done. Don't even need to think about the other team's arguments. Don't need a debate here, I already got it right. Judges care much more about the relative weights of arguments. What the judge really wants more than anything is for the debaters to compare arguments so that the judge can figure out which arguments are truly important and which arguments are correct at the end of the debate. They don't begin assessing the debate with the assumption that like, the ass arguments are better than the negs arguments, or the negs arguments are better than the affirmative arguments. They just kind of listen to everything, and they're hoping that the students compare. Debaters don't like that. They want more control. Number eight, debaters have relatively more topic knowledge than judges. Judges have relatively more common knowledge than debaters. Debaters have relatively more topic knowledge than judges. Judges have relatively more common knowledge than debaters. This one makes perfect sense. Debaters tend to know a lot about their arguments, about the topic, especially you know, specific affirmatives, specific disads, counter plans. The reason that you're going to Summer Institute is so that you, as we talked about on the first day, are experts in the topic, to develop some topic expertise. Obviously, some judges know that much about the topic. Some of them might even have more topic knowledge than you do. But that's a really small subset of judges that you're going to get. For most judges, it's the debaters that are much more expert in the topic stuff than they are. And that includes college debaters who are working on their own topic, college coaches who are working on their own topic. And they might know some stuff from camp, but they haven't, they haven't caught up during the course of the season because they're doing their own thing. That makes total sense. Uh, and high school coaches that aren't that involved in the evidence, in the argument development. Most of the judges that you get, you'll know more about the stuff you're talking about than they do. At the same time, judges have a lot more common knowledge than debaters. When you're in high school, you, know, you just don't have as much experience either with debate and all of the arguments that have been read a million times in debate, all of the debate theory arguments, impact, all of that kind of stuff, or with just life, which haven't been around that long. So you have less cultural literacy, political literacy, just kind of current events knowledge. You just you don't know as much stuff. And a lot of times you don't have the same background in the concepts that underlie the topic as the judge. So you know more about the specifics, for example, of Latin America and engagement with Cuba and Mexico and Venezuela, but the judge might know more about the Cold War. They might know more about NAFTA. They might know more about the embargo and the abstract. But you know more about you know, oil drilling as it relates to the Emerald, or Russian involvement in Latin America and stuff like that. 
But the point is, debaters and judges are coming at the debate with different relative expertise levels. Number nine, debaters expect the judge to be very meticulous and consider every argument thoroughly. Judges want debaters to communicate which arguments are most important. Debaters expect the judge to be very meticulous and consider every argument thoroughly. Judges want debaters to communicate which arguments are most important. When you're in a debate and you're saying all this stuff, you got all these cards, and you're making all these distinctions, and you're you know, comparing evidence, and you just you know so much about the topic, and you've done so much preparation, you really want the judges to remember and to understand all of those details. You want the judge to give really careful consideration to everything that you said in the debate, even things that you didn't really emphasize or draw attention to. And a lot of times you'll get upset when judges don't vote for you based on something that you said during the course of the debate, but that you didn't highlight in your final rebuttal as important. And the reason that debaters get upset is because they think that all arguments are equally important. They think they remember saying it. You know, I, I've compared that. I said that that evidence wasn't good. You know, I extended that you know, second warrant to the impact argument. I, you know, I said that the plan would be rolled back. Or whatever. I said it. Judges are much more attentive to the big picture and they're much less interested in what they see as minor details unless and until those minor details are highlighted as important by debaters. And there's one way of thinking about this, like, oh, gee, judges should pay closer attention. Why don't they try harder? Why can't the judges do better? A lot of you might be thinking that. But it's not just that judges are tired or that they're lazy or that they can't do it, that they can't follow your arguments, although a lot of times they can. It's that they're trying to make a coherent decision that accounts for the overall debating that was done in the round. And it's super difficult to do that, if not impossible to do that, if every argument is equally important. When everything is the most important argument in the debate, nothing is important. So the way that judges and debaters think about the important arguments in the debate is different. Number 10, last one. Debaters are very, very open-minded about both theory and substance. Judges have a lot more preconceptions. Debaters are very open-minded about both theory and substance. Judges have a lot more preconceptions. Again, this makes perfect sense. Debaters haven't had enough experience to make up their minds about either debate practices or about substantive arguments. And the thing that they want more than anything is just to win. So they just think that anything that can win is a good argument. They really want their debating and their opponent dropping stuff to guide the way the judge resolves arguments, and they just don't understand why judges have strong opinions about anything. They don't have a strong opinion on anything except winning. They just really want to win. It makes sense. <coughs> judges have a lot more experience. They have a lot more baggage. And they have a lot more preconceptions both about debate theory, so kind of the way that debate should be done and about substantive arguments. Judges, after they've been judging for a long time, kind of know what they think is a good debate and what's not a good debate. And they want to, you know, they want to see a good debate. And they have a lot of political leanings. You know, they've researched a lot of things, they've heard a lot of debates. They just have opinions about the world. You know, they're a Democrat or they're a Republican, they're pragmatic or they're more idealistic. You know, they everything. You know, as you get older, you just start to develop more opinions about things. Your opinions become more solidified. Good judges, obviously, and I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, keep those preconceptions as much to the side as possible, and that's good. But it's impossible to do that fully. It's impossible kind of not to be yourself when you're judging the debate. And I don't think we would really want judges to do that, because we want judges 
be educators, judges themselves want to be educators, they want to facilitate productive debates, they want to teach you something. And when they're evaluating, you know, who made a good argument, who made a bad argument, it's hard for them not to think, oh, well, I thought that was a good argument based on, you know, my understanding of the world. So those are the ten differences between debaters and judges. The second broad Roman numeral, or whatever, is the facts of judging. And this one tends to really get to some people, and I think it makes a lot of sense. And for others, they're like, duh, debates are judged. But the statement that debates are judged is powerful. And I think it's one of the most important things that debaters need to understand in order to get to the top levels of debate. I think, slash no, that many of even the very best debaters in the country, high school debaters, don't really understand what this means. So here's what I mean. Number one, judging is subjective. Judging is subjective. Judges, as we discussed before, are not, despite debaters' wishes, judging machines. They are not capable of calculating objectively who has won the debate. Both because that is impossible, and because even if it was possible, there is no objective standard for evaluating who has won a debate. The sooner that debaters kind of internalize that, accept it, make peace with it, and in fact embrace the subjectivity of debate, the better off they'll be. You kind of just have to understand that judges are going to intervene. It's an inescapable part of the subjective process of judging, but you have a lot of control over which decision they make nonetheless. And if you just refuse the idea that judging is subjective, or decide that everyone who votes against you is wrong, or that everyone who votes against you has made a mistake or is biased or whatever, you will not improve, and you just don't get it. Number two. Someone has to win and someone has to lose. Someone has to win and someone has to lose. It would help students a lot to think about the debate from the perspective of their opponents, who are just as invested in the win and care just as much about winning as they do, and to understand the position that that puts judges in. After every debate, judges have to decide who won and who lost. Which means that after every debate, judges have to make two young people happy, and they have to make two young people sad. And that sucks. Because judges can't please everyone, all they can do and all they can hope for is just get it right. You know, do the best job they can to make a good decision. No judge, I mean, there are judges that are just mean people, but the vast majority of judges that you're going to get don't want anyone to be upset. They really, they like debate and they like all of you. But they know, and they just kind of have to know, that no matter what they decide, one team's going to be sad. One team's going to be disappointed. One team might be angry, whatever the emotion is. One team wanted to win, and the judge has to say, unfortunately, you, know, you really wanted to win, I understand that, but you have lost. The, re the emotional reaction to that you know, is sad. This makes judges very anxious about getting the decision wrong. And if you, uh, if any of you have judged in a novice tournament, you know, in the prelims, you're worried about getting it wrong. If you ever make it to a panel, it's hilarious what happens. You know, high school students on a panel are, oh my God, I'm gonna get it wrong. Oh my God, I'm judging with someone older than me. Oh, it's gonna be so embarrassing. Oh, it's so much pressure. That's not unique to you. Right? All judges feel a sense of that. Even judges who've been judging forever. I still get very nervous when I'm judging important debates. I still get very nervous when I'm on panels judging important debates. If you didn't get nervous, you know, I think there'd be something wrong with you. But judges know that despite that anxiousness and despite the terrible position they've been placed in by virtue of being a judge, they have to make a decision. And so in order to make a decision, they have to make a judgment. It's right there in their name. Judge. Judgment. Judges will always, always make judgments because that's what they have to do in order to make a decision. Number three, judging is argument. Judging is argument. 
This one tends to blow people's minds. Judging always involves the construction of arguments. Judges always make arguments. And they have to because they have to argue that one side or the other side won the debate. <coughs> what I encourage you to do is to think of the decision, the RFD, the post round, the ballot, whatever, the, when the judge talks to you and explains to you won the debate, as the judge's case for or against the resolution resolved the affirmative team won the debate. Resolved the affirmative team won the debate. The judge has to either vote AF, therefore voting AF, or they have to vote NEG, therefore voting NEG. And to construct their case for or against that resolution, they're going to use as evidence for their argument and their case the different things that happened during the course of the debate. The question is, what's going to stand out to them as facts or occurrences that happened during the debate that they should use to back up their argument that their decision is the right one? So in the same way that you, you know, are careful about choosing which evidence to put in the 1AC and which evidence to put in the 2AC and which arguments to go for in the 2AR and all that, the judges have to think about what constitutes the best evidence for or against resolve the affirmative one. In doing this, judges are going to use as evidence the parts of the debate that they understood the best and that they found most persuasive or true in light of the debate. They're going to want to use the parts of the debate that they thought were more clear-cut or decisive. They're going to use the parts of the debate that were highlighted more by the debaters. But regardless of what they use, they're going to find something from the debate to help them make the decision, and help them make their case. And so when giving a last rebuttal, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes, I encourage you to think about your job not as proving that resolved the United States federal government should substantially increase blah, blah, blah in Latin America as the topic, but instead, the topic is resolved, the affirmative team has won the debate. When you're at, you want the judge to vote at, and you need to help them write that ballot. When you're neg, you want the judge to vote neg, and you need them to write that ballot. Obviously, winning that the federal government should increase its engagement, etc., helps, but it's not the whole thing. Number four, judging is comparative. Judging is comparative. One of the other things that tends to happen when students start judging for the first time is they realize that far fewer debates than they thought are clear cut or are, you know, crushes in the language that you all use. And far more debates are close. There are obviously some debates that are just clear cut and those aren't even really worth talking about because you know, you're going to win them or lose them no matter what I say here. But learning to debate and learning to speak the language of the judge is not about those debates. It's about good debates. It's about close debates. It's about what you do when the other team is strong and when the round is close. And because judges need to make comparative assessments, they tend to resolve things somewhere in the middle. They tend to be very suspicious of the things that you all say in debates. And that makes sense. They've heard many, many debates. You all have said many, many silly things. And in all of those debates, you all have disagreed with one another about the truth of the matter on the policy question, or the philosophical issue, or the ethical issue, or the theory issue, or whatever. They constantly see disagreement, and they constantly see people taking extremist positions. And so they have learned over the course of time, whether they did it on purpose or not, that the truth is almost always somewhere in the middle. So your job as a debater is not to continue to reiterate your extremist position, but to get the judge away from the middle slightly and move him or her a little bit in your direction. Debaters that assume that the judge is going to decide that they were totally right about all of their arguments and that their opponents were totally wrong about all of their arguments are always disappointed because judges don't do that. It doesn't fit with the nature of judging. So because of that, you need to get away from yes or no, and instead debate about how much. Debate about relative amounts. 
So it's not yes or no, there's a link, it's how much is, of a link is there. It's not yes or no, there's an impact, it's how much impact is there. And the sooner you can start comparing your arguments to your opponents, instead of just rehashing your arguments and insulting the arguments of your opponent, the better off you will be. Those are the four facts of judging. It's subjective, someone has to win, someone has to lose. The act of judging itself is argument, and judging is always comparative. Roman numeral three, or big point three. Knowing all of this, how to better persuade judges to vote for you. How to persuade judges to vote for you. So hopefully you've already thought of a lot of things that you might do slightly differently based on what you now understand to be the differences between debaters and judges and what you know to be the facts of judging. But what can you do to kind of concretely increase your chance of winning. Uh, before I dive into that, I want to make the obvious claim that the biggest thing you can do to win all of your debates is to make good arguments, support them with good evidence, you know, be technically excellent, do all the things that just are good debating and all the other things that you're learning at Summer Institute. Good debating obviously wins debates. That's not what this is about. This is about the margins. This is about the close debates. This is about the debates between excellent teams. This is about the debates between teams of similar ability levels. None of these tips can replace good arguments and good preparation and good evidence and good execution and good connections and all of that. But they are nonetheless incredibly powerful. And they're incredibly important in the close debates. And it's those close debates which matter the most. Number one. Speak clearly. Speak clearly. This is either the number one or number two complaint of judges. The other being flowing, you don't flow. But I don't think that students understand how important it is. Students think, because they have the debating perspective, that if they're a little bit unclear, they can get more stuff out, which puts more pressure on their opponents and therefore increases their chance of winning the debate. That's what students think. And students think that because they're debating. They're thinking about it from the perspective of a debater. It's harder to debate teams that are unclear. It's harder to debate larger speeches with more evidence and more arguments. But just because it is harder to debate does not mean that it's better. And in fact, because it is harder to debate, it is harder to judge. If judges do not understand your arguments, they will not be able to confidently use your arguments as evidence in their decisions. And they will be more likely to disregard details that you thought were really important. The more clear your delivery, the more details the judge is willing to consider. And so whether you believe me or not, the clearer you are, the more arguments you get considered by the judge. And in fact, you get more considered than if you tried to go faster, sacrificing clarity. In addition, if the judge understands most of your arguments upon initial presentation, so the first time that you introduce the argument, the 1AC, the 1NC, the 2AC, whatever, they will find those arguments more memorable. And memorable arguments are more likely to find their way into the judge's decision because the judge will feel more secure and more confident in using them as evidence to support their decision. If you're sure that this is what the argument was, and you've kind of understood the argument all along, it's much easier to say to the other team, I voted against you, and here's what their argument was, and here's why they won that argument. If your understanding of that argument was non-existent or minimal during the course of the debate, it's much harder to put yourself on the line it's much harder to tell the other team, you lost, this is what the argument was. Because you're afraid, remember, as an anxious judge who wants to get it right and doesn't want anyone to be upset, that you're getting it wrong because you didn't understand it when it was first communicated. So maybe the team, maybe the argument changed over the course of the debate. Maybe the argument isn't what the judge thinks it is. Speaking clearly helps at the margins. If you are the clearer team, you have a better chance of winning, period. 
And I understand that the vast majority of you will continue to try to go as fast as possible. Uh, it's your loss. Number two, make connections. Make connections. There needs to be a balance between high speed technical execution and persuasive communication in a debate. On important arguments, round deciding arguments, you need to slow down and you need to connect with the judge. That doesn't mean that you turn debate into original oratory, but it does mean that you slow down, you quiet down, or you emphasize the argument more, you look at the judge, you move a little bit, you make some connection. And the reason that this is important is because you can't reasonably expect the judges to get everything down. You gotta help them out. You gotta let them know by communicating to them, verbally and non-verbally, what arguments you think are real important, and which arguments you think they need to be paying close attention to and giving first consideration when they start to make their decision. Judges will remember the connections that you make whether they believe it or not. The idea of connections is not something that we made up in debate. It's about the way that public speaking works. It's about the way that human psychology affects the way that we understand and interpret speech. It works. So judges will remember those connections, but they will not remember most of the details of the debate. So you need to choose wisely about which parts of the debate you draw attention to and which parts of the debate you get the judge to pay close attention to. There are a lot of ways to make connections. You can get a little louder, you can get a little softer, you can slow down your pace, you can speed up your pace, you can change your tone, you can look at the judge, you can make eye contact, you can use hand gestures, you can even turn your whole body and really make a connection on an important argument such that the judge even if they're staring at their computer, will look at you and they will pay attention and they will remember what you said in that moment. And then you can return to doing what you were doing for the rest of the speech. Great debaters communicate with the judge, not at the judge. With the judge, not at the judge. Think about the people that you like to have conversations with. And think about the way they engage you. And think about the people who are charismatic. You, you know, a lot of you love Seth Gannon. You love the way that he engages you. He's making connections with you. You can steal all of that stuff, and you can put variations of that into your speaking. You can also make connections through where you place arguments and how you allocate time. If you put an argument at the top of your speech, at the beginning of your speech, or at the top of a flow, beginning of a flow, judges are more likely to consider it important because you have elevated it to the first thing that you talk about. In the same way that an introduction to a five paragraph essay or an introduction to a public speech is important, so is the introduction to a rebuttal. If you spend more time on an argument or invest more time reading evidence or provide more explanation, judges are more likely to consider it important because it seemed like you, by virtue of spending more time there, by virtue of investing more explanation there or reading more evidence there, considered that argument very important. In my opinion, every speech should make at least some connections. And they vary from constructives to rebuttals, starting with the 1AC. Some connections are really minor, like emphasizing important words or phrases and tags and evidence, trying to guide what the judge writes down. Other connections, especially in rebuttals, are major and they need to be more dramatic. Your goal is to make an impression on the judge that lets them know you think the argument you made is really important and that will remind them of that argument when they're later making their decision. The more important the argument, the more important it is to make a connection. And let me emphasize again, you have to be selective. If you connect on five arguments in a 2AR, six arguments in a 2NC, that negates the value of that connection because the judge isn't going to remember all six. This is not, I'm not suggesting that you just kind of yell a lot or that you kind of become theatrical. I'm suggesting that you figure out which arguments you think are most important and then you make sure the judge understands that. 
Because there is another danger in making a connection, and that's number three. Make counter connections. Make counter connections. When your opponent makes a connection, I think it is really important to counter it. So I would suggest in the same way that you would circle a voting issue or you would circle a place where they said, you know, the plan gets rolled back or turns the case or some, some of the powerful language, I would circle a connection that they made and I would attempt to make a connection of my own that kind of fights back or by connecting on a different argument that answers or responds to the argument that your opponent connected on. The point is that you can't allow strong connections to be made by the other team, uh, and you can't allow those connections to just kind of sit in the judge's mind and become internalized, because not that much later, from the time that that first connection was made, the judge is just gonna assume that that thing was true for the rest of the debate. They're gonna remember it, they're gonna just, it's gonna become part of the decision. So you have to figure out a way to stop that from happening. One way is to challenge that connection in the cross-ex. If it's in a constructive speech. And to challenge it in the speeches if it's in a rebuttal speech. There are a couple of classic counter-connection moves. One classic counter-connection is to explain to the judge that while the opponent was right, that they're doing really well on the argument they connected on, they have overestimated its importance relative to another argument that you are winning. So the negative makes a strong connection in the 2NR on disad turns the case and we have a giant impact. 2AR says, yes, the 2NR is right. But they're doing very well on the impact. However, in their zeal to spend so much time re-explaining that impact, they have overestimated the importance of the impact in this debate. This debate is about the link. And in the link, they're in trouble. First, second, third. And by doing that, you have given the judge a different way to think about the argument that the other team thought they were doing so well on. Another classic counter-connection is to challenge whether the evidence that supports the other team's argument, the argument that they're connecting on, is good enough. You want to plant the seed in the judge's mind that the other team is trying to make up for deficiencies in their evidence, for having weak materials, with bluster with theatrics, that they're trying to trick the judge. They're trying to pull one over on the judge. They're trying to get the judge to vote on weak evidence just by being enthusiastic about it. This puts the judge on the defensive and is very powerful because the judge doesn't want to be duped. The judge doesn't want to vote on that evidence and then feel like, oh, I got tricked by this team. The judge doesn't want that. Counter connections, there are many more. Number four, write a comparative ballot. Write a comparative ballot. In my opinion, the whole debate from the time that the 1AC starts, and even before the prep time, before the debate, the whole thing is a process of developing affirmative and negative ballots. As the round develops, both teams settle on the one ballot that they want to give to the judge at the end of the debate for final consideration. And at the end of the round, the judge takes those two ballots and they assess them. And they pick the one that they agree with more, and then they explain their decision in the form of an argument for or against resolve the affirmative team one. The question that judges have to ask is which ballot is stronger? They have to think, you know, this affirmative ballot, it's a pretty good ballot. There's a lot of reason to believe this ballot is the best one, but this negative ballot is also really strong. Maybe there's a couple of things that are just a little bit better about the negative ballot, given everything that happened in the debate. You know, there were a few moments where I thought the negative really connected powerfully on important arguments. I think the negative was right about this fundamental issue. So while I could vote affirmative, and that could be a good decision, I think this is the better one. The negative is the better one. And that's what judges do. And knowing that that's what judges do, whether they know that consciously or not, final rebuttalists should argue that the case for their teams winning the ballot is better than the case for the other team winning the ballot. In other words, that the affirmative ballot when you're affirmative is better than the negative ballot, and the negative ballot is better than the affirmative ballot when you're negative. 
you want to convince the judge that the decision that is in your favor is just a better decision. This is a fundamentally different way to conceptualize final rebuttals than the one that is used by most debaters and taught by many people. Many people think that the purpose of the final rebuttals is to prove your arguments, it's to win your arguments. I think that the purpose is to win the ballot, to prove the ballot. The reason this is so challenging for many students is because it requires that you acknowledge, honestly, that there is a way that the other team could win the debate. And not only a way that the other team could win the debate, but a way that the other team should win the debate. Almost every debate is close enough, especially good, important debates, the kind of debates we care about winning, are close enough that either team could win and the judge could present a strong justification for that ballot. If you look at important elimination rounds, how many of those debates are two ones or three twos, even among the finest judges in the country, it seems so obvious and yet people don't seem to get it. Almost always the judge can vote AF or NEG and have a strong case. So as a debater, understanding that, you need to acknowledge that you might lose in order to provide the judge with a realistic case for your ballot. In my opinion, far too many, almost all, final rebuttal overviews and even final rebuttals are really useless as a judge because they assume circumstances for deciding that as a judge I would never ever be in. They assume that their side has completely won some arguments. They assume that the other side has completely lost some arguments. Judges are not going to be in that situation. Judges are going to be in a situation where it's like a little bit of a disad versus even less of a case. Or you know, the K is pretty good, but the alt is terrible versus a small advantage. Or you know, minor differences between topicality interpretations. Or minor differences between the way theory has been executed. Or you know, a big risk of the DA, but a conceded advantage, or whatever. They're all close. And so if you're realistic about how much you are likely to win and how much your opponent is likely to win, then your rebuttal overview is much more effective. It gives the judge some evidence they can use in their decision. Judges don't like it when they have to do that comparison themselves, when they have to decide, all right, I decided that the disad was 20% and I decided that the advantage was 10%, so I voted negative. It's really hard to do that when the negative said they would win 100% of the disad and the ass said they would win 100% of the case and they compared it as if that was the contingency. If the negative team said, we're gonna win, you know, we'll win some risk of our disad, not a ton, but that risk outweighs the affirmative, and the affirmative said, we're gonna win our whole case and they're gonna win no disad, the judge is voting negative 99 times out of 100 because they're gonna feel connected to that ballot. They're gonna feel like that ballot is more consistent with the way they have reasonably judged the debate. And it might actually be true that the affirmative won the debate. The affirmative might have actually proven more of their advantage than they proved their disadvantage. But because the negative framed the ballot in a way that was more consistent with the way the judge was likely to assess the arguments, the negative won the debate. If one of the teams, one of the two final rebuttalists, argues that the ballot for their side is superior to the ballot for the other side, and the other team does not say a word, the team that does the comparison wins. And obviously, you can't just do that and then beat a team that has been destroying you throughout the debate. But if this is a close debate, if this is a contested debate, and most debates are, this tactic alone will win many, 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 many rounds. The point of this exercise, or the point of this tactic, is to make the judge feel safe with your ballot. To make the judge feel like they can defend your ballot against criticism, both from the other team and from anyone else, other judges, other people who are watching the debate. Because remember, one of the facts of judging, anxious, hoping to get it right, nervous. Here are some advanced tips for how to write the ballot. Number one, uh, or sub, I guess we'll do sub point A. 
use the language of policy. The first few sentences of your overview should not be language that you learned in debate. The first few sentences should be about the actual policies that are being considered, or the actual philosophies, or the actual interpretations, or whatever. But they should not be filled with jargon. So instead of saying the DA outweighs the case because Russian war is a bigger magnitude impact than oil spills uh, in Cuba, say the risk of a Cuban oil spill is justified in order to avoid a high magnitude risk of Russian conflict, or even get rid of the magnitude, to avoid the risk of Russian conflict caused by expansion of Russia and Latin America. If you're affirmative, engaging Cuba is necessary to protect the region from a devastating oil spill. That is a more urgent priority than preventing Russia from encroaching Latin America. Using the language of policy instead of the language of jargon helps make sense of complicated debates and it helps you identify the nexus issue that the judge will need to decide in order to decide who won the debate. So point B, admit weakness. It is okay, and in fact better than okay, it is good, to agree with the other team on some things and argue that you should still win the debate, despite those things. A lot of students think that this is a failure because it's admitting that the other team was right about something or that they were wrong about something. Obviously, you don't want to concede arguments that will destroy your position or that will make you unable to win the debate. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is seen as a strength by the judge, not a failing, because it acknowledges to the judge that you are connected to reality and you have a realistic understanding of how the debate has progressed. And as a result, you are a more credible witness to cite in the judge's case for or against resolve the affirmative team won the debate. If the negative team constantly sounds like they have won every argument and seems to not really understand what has happened in the debate, and the affirmative team you know, concedes where the negative was good, but argues that the affirmative is still the better overall position, the judge is much more likely to cite the affirmative's argument in their decision because it just seems more credible. In the same way that in a debate, you would find evidence that kind of acknowledges the other side's position but then still argues that the conclusion that it has come to is wrong, is much better than hyperbolic, over-the-top evidence. So the reason that evidence that's like, you know, nuclear terrorism will cause extinction loses to evidence that nuclear terrorism is obviously going to be bad, but it's not going to cause extinction. So point C, trace argument development. Trace argument development. This is mostly uh, something for the 2AR to do, but it's also possible in some spots in the 2NR. What you do is you summarize what I would call the narrative arc of the debate on some important issue. So if you're affirmative, you can return to the 2AC on an argument on a disad and kind of trace how that argument has evolved over the course of the debate. So, for example, you could say on the argument about oil spills, the negative, the packet affirmative has the argument that there's no drilling occurring now in Cuba. It's a strong negative argument. You can say, in the 2AC, we read evidence that drilling in Cuba is inevitable for a multitude of reasons. The negative responded only with evidence that speaks to the inevitability of that drilling, but not to the imminent threat that that drilling poses. The 1AR evidence demonstrates that there is no drilling for several more years. And so even though the 2NR might win the argument that at some point in the future there will be drilling, that does not support their impact comparison because the threat is large or whatever. On a disad, you can say, you know, especially in a situation where the negative has read a bunch of evidence, you can say in the 2AC, we said that the collapse of Chavez demonstrates that the pink tide is no more. The negative has read a bunch of evidence in the negative block that suggests that oil dollars are important for the pink tide, but they have never fundamentally addressed our claim that without a robust leader with charisma and a commitment to expansion of socialism, the pink tide is doomed. 
The 2NR is right that they have a lot of evidence about the importance of oil money, but they have never fundamentally addressed the thesis of our argument. This is a great way to allow kind of new arguments into the 2AR, because it connects the arguments you're making to the debate that has occurred. And it helps the judge a lot, because it helps the judge make sense not only of the final rebuttals, but of the overall course of the debate. This is super powerful against teams that are obsessed with concessions. Because you can figure out a way to explain how the debate has evolved without a concession. And when they're banking on half conceded stuff, it gives you a shot. Subpoint D, last one, understand cognitive biases. Understand cognitive biases. So in debate, there are a lot of words and phrases and concepts that are loaded. They're like loaded terms. Turns the case, or value to life, or whatever. When using that term helps you use it, because using that term will get the judge to admit not only the words that you have said, but also just kind of the concept of the argument. So like winners win. If you use that phrase, judges kind of know what that means. You'll get credit for a lot more than what you have expressed in the debate. So knowing that, you can use that for, to your advantage. You can kind of know which words and which phrases connect a lot with judges. Sufficiency on the counterpoint. Everyone loves that later. When the bias goes the other way, it's important to explicitly challenge it. I think Turn's case is a great example of that. So the negative in there, 2NR overview, will make a big deal about how the disad turns the case. Challenge what that means. You know? They've said the disad turns the case because a war with Russia would cause environmental destruction, but that's just an alternate causality to our oil spills advantage. They have not contested that an oil spill is imminent, that it would destroy the environment. There is no way that Russian expansion in Latin America will make an oil spill more likely. So at best, they've just won that if there's a nuclear war, we don't have to care about oil spills. But they won't win that there will be a nuclear war with Russia. And they don't have any realistic impact comparison between Russian expansionism and oil spills. This is particularly helpful if you have dropped something, because you can challenge the impact to what you have dropped. So maybe the one error drops an argument about Turn's case. The two error can say, they've said Turn's case, but that doesn't mean anything. All they have really done is identified an alternate causality. So you know they've said immigration reform is key to Latin American relations. That doesn't mean that the plan hurts Latin American relations. It just means that there's some other factor that affects Latin American relations than Cuba policy. So yes. This minimizes that advantage somewhat, but our evidence is still powerful and was extended well by the 1AR that the Cuban embargo is the most important issue damaging <coughs> US-Latin American relations. So yes, they win some impact defense. No, they do not turn the case. Number five, provide RFD talking points. Provide RFD talking points or decision Talking points, RFD, reason for decision, whatever. Valid talking points. As we have discussed, and as you will experience, making decisions and defending them is difficult and stressful. The more that you can do to give the judge the tools they need to defend the decision that you want them to make, voting for you, the more likely they will be to do so. Just human nature. I have three basic suggestions. So point A, Give the judge something for which to compliment the other team. Give the judge something for which to compliment the other team. Judges do not want to make anyone feel bad. They want to be able to tell the other team that they did some things well, maybe even several things well, many things well, but in the end they fell just short. So unfortunately they didn't win the debate, but they did a good job. So point B, is give the judge something for which to criticize the other team. Remember, judges are nervous and they want to get it right. They want to feel like the criticisms that they're going to make of the other team, their arguments, their presentation, their execution, whatever, are understandable and apparent to anyone. So they want to think if anyone had come in and watched this debate, they would be saying the same thing I'm going to say. They would have said, you know, thought you were doing really well in this ad, but 
man, you just didn't spend enough time in this advantage and it's big. Or I thought you were doing really well on most of the K, but you know, you just dropped this argument about value of life and you know, just seems like it's really important. Judges want to know what they should say to the other team to explain to that other team why they lost. And so if you watch a lot of decisions and you think about it, and I have studied this basically in an anecdotal way, the vast majority of decisions that are issued are, I voted affirmative, negative, you're really good in a lot of places, but this one place wasn't good enough. Or voted affirmative, or voted negative, affirmative, you're really good in a lot of places you came close, but this one thing. It's a comfortable, an easy ballot to write, and it's a comfortable and easy conversation to have, relatively speaking, because it allows you to diffuse the kind of anger, upset, sadness, regret, whatever, of criticism with some compliments, and it allows the judge to give a balanced decision. The judge doesn't want to just be helping one team and not the other, they want to be helping both teams. So point C then is give the judge something for which to criticize you, but still vote for you. In the same way the judges don't just want to criticize the other team, they don't just want to compliment you. They don't want to think, they don't want you to think that they think you're perfect. And they don't think that you're perfect. And they don't want to just spend the post-round time complimenting you. If you give them something to criticize you for, and you can find something that's realistic but not essential to the nexus issue of the debate, you're giving them something they need psychologically, but you're giving them an out, basically. You're giving them a way to, to meet that need without seriously considering voting against you. Acknowledging that you could have done better somewhere is not going to hurt you, especially if you explain that while you weren't perfect or great on this particular issue or argument, you were sufficient to win the debate. Classic example, you know, the one in R, bunch of turns case stuff on the disc ad, one ER is light on that, the two in R really wants to win that turns case ballot. The negative is doing well on the impact defense, or the affirmative is doing well on the impact defense to our impact. We'll win some risk of that, but they're doing poorly on the turns case. Now I understand that the one AR was not perfect in explaining the nuances of all of these arguments, but the one AR's only response was durable fiat, and that doesn't respond to the first argument or the second argument. Those arguments are enough to vote negative because if we win those arguments, the risk of the case is very low. You've given the judge something to say. So after the debate, the judge would say, well, I voted negative. Thought you were good on beating the impact to the initial disad. So I didn't think there was a big risk of that. But I thought the negative was right, that you didn't answer the turns case very well. Now, negative, I thought you needed to do a better job of beginning that explanation in the one and R. Started a little bit late. But I think that those arguments were expressed well enough in the one and R, and especially given the way the one R didn't answer them very well, I decided to vote negative. That happens all the time. But debaters don't take the opportunity to control it. Debaters leave it in the judge's hands to find something to decide, to find something to criticize, to find something to compliment. Now I want to issue a strong caveat that what I'm talking about here is not criticizing a team or a debater, it is criticizing an argument, or it is criticizing a choice. And it must be professional and it must be reasonable and fair and honest. Judges are turned off by the constant refrain of they've conceded, 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 conceded. And judges certainly don't want you to say, you know, nice try, you did a good job on the impact, but you sucked on the turns case, so you're probably going to lose this one. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about writing those comparative ballots, talking about the arguments, and the amount of time and emphasis that the other team placed on those arguments, and the arguments themselves, not the individuals that you are competing against. 
And I hope that none of you uh, kind of get the wrong impression from this. As much as possible, in summary, your final rebuttal must provide the judge with a response to the arguments that the other team is likely to make if the judge votes against them. Anticipate what their gripe will be, what their grievance will be. If you're at and you're giving a two error against that turns case thing I just talked about, so the neg is really going all in on turns case. If the judge votes affirmative, the negative is obviously going to say, but what about the 1AR? The 1AR was not deep on these arguments. The 1AR did not answer these arguments. So in the 2AR, you can either ignore that and hope that the judge figures out something to say to the other team, or you can help them out. You can say, I understand that the 1AR was not strong in answering the turns case arguments, but those turns case arguments are only alternate causalities. They don't turn the case. And they were never applied to our oil spills advantage, which is insulated from the argument, the warrant that they provided. So while they are right that they're doing well on our Latin American relations advantage, which by the way we're not going for, they are doing poorly on the oil spills advantage, and the oil spills advantage outweighs, even though the one error was weak on turns case. And that kind of explanation, that kind of thinking, and that kind of packaging, and that kind of presentation, and that kind of connection with the judge is exactly what the judge desperately wants. The judge wants that because without that, the judge is on their own. They're on an island. And they have to somehow decide who to vote for and who to vote against. Because that is the fact of judging, and that is what their job is to do. That is all I have. Questions? So. Questions? Yes. Okay. In the final rebuttal, when you want to give all the reasons to vote for your team and also a reason to criticism and you know, something good, does that almost lead you to the point to not only criticize yourself but like your arguments? Sometimes. I think a lot of times acknowledging that your evidence is weak before the judge gets it in their hands is powerful because that way the judge is prepared for the evidence being a little weak. So you can say, you know, our evidence that Cuba has a ton of oil isn't great, but it makes the distinction between heavy crude and light sweet crude, and that distinction is important and it's unaddressed by the negatives of, or by the affirmative evidence. So while our evidence isn't as good as it could be, our evidence is good enough to beat their something like that. Yes, I think that's very powerful. Uh, I think if you have, if you you know, be realistic. If your card is really good, then obviously you don't do that. You know, our evidence is very strong. There's nothing wrong with our evidence. If your evidence is weaker, be realistic about it. It's much worse for you to be like, you know, our unique evidence is so decisive, it's like the greatest card I've ever seen, it's literally on fire, and then the judge reads it and they're like, this is terrible. You have then not given them a chance to know what to do once they've read your evidence and decided that it was terrible. If you're like, you know, our evidence isn't that conclusive, but the way the warrant that we've explained is definitely uncontested by their evidence, and our evidence is good enough to suggest this, this, and this, or whatever. Then when the judge gets the evidence, they're like, yeah, this isn't great, but it's what they said. So yeah, they're right. Forage. Do you have any suggestions for how to end the final rebuttal? Uh, how, like what judges like to hear commonly? I think the best thing that you can, uh, I don't think it matters that much. It, it only matters in the negative, and that's if you feel like you are rambling or running out of time. I think the powerful ending is awesome. So if you can be going along and you're like, Blah 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 blah. There is no risk of an oil spill. Beep, 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 beep. That's powerful. And then everyone like shuts up, and that's awesome. So the best final rebuttal conclusions I've seen are just kind of strong. The thing that you can do to try to not mess that up is like, even if you've got 15 seconds left, if the thing that you're going to talk about next is just totally unimportant, just stop and powerfully you don't just ramble for the last 15 seconds. Uh, and if you, you need to have some sense that like, all right, I was anticipating that I was gonna extend three more arguments on the disad, but screw <laughs> it, I only have time for one. Just do the one well and then boom, end it. Okay. I think perceptually, the judge mostly votes on what's at the beginning of the speech anyway, so it doesn't matter that much, but I think you can, I think you can make a powerful connection at the end and you just like seem like, boom. You know what he was doing and he just like did it, wow. Uh, no confusion there, no mess up time allocation, whatever. Gotcha. Other questions? Yes. 
Uh, this may be a bit of a big question, uh, but when debating in front of less experienced judges, more conservative, more old school, uh, do you think that there are like a set of unique things that you need to do, or just sort of? Oh, I love this stuff. A lot of this stuff is like killer at NFL uh, and stuff like that. You have to tweak it because a lot of this was written with like national circuit judges in mind in terms of the examples and stuff. But I think you can tweak it and appeal to the things that they're interested in, appeal to the things that they want to hear. So if this is a stock issues debate, you know, you can tailor your examples and your your framing. Like, yes, they've presented some evidence that this is a significant harm. But let's be realistic. Our evidence is much more qualified. And you know, you haven't heard about this issue before. It's not a pressing issue. When you think about all of the things that the president can be spending his time on, this isn't it or whatever. And like some of that stuff at NFL Nationals can be awesome. And if the if the judging pool is more like that, I think some of this is even more important. Because a lot of them, you know, like they flow, but the line by line isn't as important. A lot of the technical stuff isn't as important. So you can kind of connect on the big picture and the appeal to like, I'm with you, you know, they seem kind of silly, they're like being hyperbolic, or they're, uh, they don't seem to understand reality, they're in the little debate world over there, I'm with you in the judge world. I think that's super powerful for judges that are uh, more old school or like speechy. But all this stuff is the stuff that I used to teach for NFL and CFL and nationals in particular. You can win a ton of debates with just a strong rebuttal overview that's just like paints the picture of which policy should be enacted. Judges eat that up. Other questions? Yes? I just have a question about this tracing of argument development. Yep. Um, like, when do you know when that will be like helpful? or when? Is that if it's an important uh, argument in the debate, and if you feel like doing that improves your chances of winning? And the situation where that's most common is there's some disagreement about what the issue even is, uh, or there's disagreement about coverage. So like, the NAIC starts accusing the app of dropping stuff, and the app's like, no, you dropped our stuff. And it's like, the two hour just needs to be like, look, this is just a battle of competing accusations that we've dropped stuff. No one has dropped anything, but here's what has happened. The 2AC said this, the negative responded in this way, we responded with this. They just reiterated the same argument, which is not a response to our claim from the beginning. Our claim is this. If we win this, then this. And that, I think that package is super, super, super persuasive. Because what ends up happening on an important issue like that, if it's an issue where there's disagreement about what has occurred and kind of who's right about who dropped stuff slash who got, you know, who's like not answering the other side's argument, uh, the, what the judge will have to do is they will have to trace the development of the argument. They'll be like, I need to see the two AC cards, I need to see the two NC cards. All right, I don't know what's going on. If you give them a way to interpret the whole thing, then the way they read your cards and the way they put together the debate will be in your favor. That's a good question. Yes? For tracing in the 2NR, the only time that I can see that the app would be on the case, case or counter plan or K. So like a lot of times when the 2AC has messed something up, it's super important to trace back to the 2AC. So you know, we read our condition on uh, you know, releasing a prisoner counter plan. The 2AC did not make a substantive net benefit argument. The 1AR's claim that our net benefit is contrived is not in the 2AC and is disputed by the ex explanation of the 1NR at the top of that flow. So when the 2AR indicts our, the veracity of our scenario, that is inconsistent with the argument they've made previously in the debate. That should be inadmissible. Now here's what our impact is, or something like that. Uh, that tends to be super helpful. Yes? How should debaters, like within a debate round, adapt to the fact that like judges have more common knowledge and debaters have more topic knowledge? Don't overreach. Don't, uh, don't assume that you know everything. Be humble. Like, show off the stuff that you do know but only show off the stuff that you actually know. So a lot of times what happens is uh, debaters will want to like, they'll know that the other debater doesn't know very much about you know, history or something. So be like, so what happened in the Peloponnesian War to like cause econ to decline and cause war or whatever? And you just sound like an idiot because you don't know what you're talking about. Or more likely, you know, you start talking about Russia and the Cold War or whatever and you really don't know what you're talking about. So if you are faking it, don't fake it. And if you feel like you do know something, then it's obviously fine to show it off, but just don't be so confident. Because a lot of times debaters will be like, I know more than this student, or I know more than this student, so therefore I am very smart about this issue. I'm gonna show that off when they forget. It's like, oh yeah, Tim Mahoney is judging the debate. He knows 
five times as much about the Cold War as any of the students do. And so it's just like intellectual humility, I think, is really important. And the flip side is just because you know more about the specifics of the arguments, the bar for explanation is raised. You need to be more explanatory. You need to be more clear. You need to provide the judge with more background if the background is relevant to how they're going to read the cards or how they're going to decide an important issue. So like most of the judges that will judge you this year will have no idea that Repsol is a Spanish oil drilling company that started drilling operations in Cuba in 2012 but stopped because they didn't find it. They will not know that. But your evidence will know that, and the affirmative authors will know that, the affirmative team will know that, and they'll all be debating as if everyone knew that. But the judge is kind of left out of that. So it's like, the judge might know like stuff about oil, stuff about the way the oil market works that you don't know about. But they're not going to know the specifics that have to do with your case. So always think about, you know, is, the, is it reasonable for the judge to, to know what I'm talking about? And always err on the side of, no, let me make sure that I explain. Which is why it's so important to be efficient if you've been here for the double header. Other questions? Yes? When you feel there was a 2AC mistake that problematizes like any chance they have to win, I don't like the phrase, the debate is over. How else do you feel you can say that in the block or in the 1AR? Yeah, uh, in, so the block if the 2AC messed up? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you should acknowledge how, what options they have left. So like, you know, they have answered the wrong topicality argument. You could say, you know, they still have a shot in this debate. They can win reasonability, or they can win that, you know, this interpretation applies somehow. First, not gonna win reasonability. Second, not gonna win this other thing. And like, figure out whatever the best thing you can think of is that they could do, and then just like really strongly answer those things. And then say, you know, the one AR should not be able to make new arguments because I do the whole thing about you know this is this is the late breaking debates are bad they lead to shallow clash the negative needs to make a choice in the block we can't wait till after the one AR to make that choice um, and all of that but instead of saying that it's over and seeming like there's no point in the firm still debating kind of let them know what they could do or let the judge in on like yeah well there's there's it's conceivable they could somehow win and these are not good options but that way it doesn't seem like it's over but it is over and you've not only have you given them the perception that they could win, but you actually stopped them from having any chance of winning. Whereas if you just are like, it's game over, they messed up our T argument, no new answers in the 1AR, done, 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 you actually did leave open those options where they could you know, say reasonability or cross-apply something or whatever. So I would give them as much credit as possible on the possible ways they could win. That's a really good question. I think in general, it's not over as often as people think. Like even messing up a two ACNT, like that's the worst thing I could think of. Or like dropping conditionality. It's still not over. There's still something they can say. Other questions? Still got a couple of minutes. Maybe one more, maybe two. You know, anything that you want to ask me about judge psychology, final rebuttals, writing ballots? Yes. What is the place in the final rebuttals for jargon? Uh, None. I mean, I, I hate jargon always unless it facilitates clear communication. On the line by line, like obviously you can say uniqueness and stuff like that. But in the overview, I think you want to eliminate it as much as possible. Uh, but yeah, line by line. And only to the extent that it facilitates clear communication. So like, I didn't really talk about this in the efficiency lecture, but the reason we have jargon is to make things easier. So like the reason that medical professionals have a medical jargon so they can talk to one another more efficiently. The reason we have jargon in debate is so that we can talk to one another more efficiently. So when I say CP, you know what that means. When I say DA, you know what that means. Impact, you know what that means. All these words like mean something that otherwise would take a long time to explain. The problem is when the jargon becomes confusing and it stops, it becomes a barrier to effective communication instead of facilitator of it. So the question is just sort of, does this make the explanation clearer or does this complicate things? In the rebuttal overview, especially the final rebuttal overview, I think that almost always it tends to confuse the nexus issue. Because it, instead of just being like, should the United States uh, engage Cuba over oil drilling or not? The question is like, does the DA outweigh in turn the case versus the case outweighing turning the DA, which you know is faster and more probable with the other things in higher magnitude? It's like all very confusing. Make it simple. Uh, so a lot of the lecture was tailored to like the final rebuttals. What are some like ways to exploit judge psychology earlier on in the debate? Think about the final rebuttals throughout the debate. The whole debate is a process of introducing and then developing and choosing balance. 
So think about the balance that you want to introduce in the 1MC. Think about the balance that you want to introduce in the 2AC. And think about how your choices in the debate impacts what you can say in the final rebuttal. It's all about the final rebuttal. So if you know that if you introduce this ballot and they say this and you say this and they say this, you're going to end up in a place where that final rebuttal is unpersuasive or it's kind of pigeonholed and it's you know, in a bad spot, then don't do that. Then start over and rethink the way that you've made those choices in the debate. In the same way, if you know that, you know, if you introduce this, they're likely to do this, you're likely to do this, you're going to be in this position in the final rebuttal and you feel strong about that, you, know, you have good cards on the right side of the issue, you've worked on that, you feel confident in that, then do that and try and do everything you can to, from the beginning, get the judge thinking along with you, to follow along, and then when you get to that moment in the final rebuttal where you're like, all right, this is what we've been debating about, this is what the debate's about, this is why you should vote affirmative, but this is why you should vote negative. You've kind of, the judge has been along for that whole ride. It's not like, surprise, judge, we decided to go for this. It's like, oh, I understand as a judge why you went for that. You've been developing that position throughout the whole day. That's a good question. Anything else? 